welcome everybody to Negotiating Cultural Appropriation, Lineages, Teaching and Relationships. This is part two of a four part series of community driven and sourced technical assistance workshops from the Philadelphia Folklore Project going live with what is actually a national and today international conversation around this topic. My name is Naomi Stern Vijaysinger and I am the executive director of the Philadelphia Folklore Project. And I'm still relatively new to the organization and to the region. So it's a great pleasure for me to be able to welcome everybody and get to know everyone participating in this panel personally. Um, just a little bit of background on the Philadelphia Folklore Project. We have been in action since 1987 and our work has been diverse and complex and multi-layered, but always around a central premise to harness traditional knowledge in service of social change. And as such, our slogan has been um, folk arts for social change since 1987. So we do a lot of different things, but one of the things we have done without fail since that time is to provide technical assistance to artists, local organizations, communities, and individuals in Philadelphia and the, the five surrounding counties. And we do that work as an organization, but also as a state folk arts partner for the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts. And so one of the things that we do each year is we do a series of technical assistance workshops, and those have run the gamut from help with grant writing to social media to um, <clears throat> self-representation and, and pitching your work as artists, done all kinds of things to you know empower and help traditional artists in our region. And so this year, in addition to our regular grant workshops and those kind of financial supports, we actually thought we would do something a little different. And that came from the community. It came from actually one of our staff members, uh, Sinta Panyami Storms, together with another organizer of these panels, um, Marusmita Bora, who's a, a traditional Hatria dancer in the community here. They had had their ears to the ground and been in conversation with different folks around Philadelphia. And there, was, there were questions among traditional arts practitioners about how to negotiate cultural appropriation um, maybe not so much within their own communities, but also on a larger level when thinking about funding, um, the ways that this was impacted by the pandemic. There's all, you know, we went through <clears throat> yet um, another wave of really important activism surrounding race and culture this year. And with that came new language, came new ideas. And so all these things started to come up and really come to a head um, for many traditional artists in our, in our field. And so we thought, well, why not make this conversation uh, a roundtable experience and a place to share and to learn? And you know, folks were also looking for language and ways to to talk about this stuff and ways to affect change in their communities as activists on the ground. So I said, all right, well, maybe let's make that the focus of our, our technical assistance workshops this year. And so that's a little background on how this program came to be. Um, and we had. Um, our last session, the first one for those who are joining us again, sort of a, a last time on negotiating cultural appropriation, our focus was on foreign cultural lineages. And I think that that was a really beautiful panel. And one of the things that you know we really enjoyed from that was this idea of we got away from maybe the notorious patrolling of culture. And we really got into the sides of what it means to be a part of a lineage um, about you know, earning your place, respect and reverence for tradition, paying attention, um, really garnering that kind of love and, and, and support within a tradition for your teachers. And you know, that sets us up beautifully for our conversation today, which is about teaching culture. Um, and inside or outside or in between, because how do you become part of a lineage? Well, often by learning and by teaching culture. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a really exciting conversation to continue, uh, one that I think is very connected. But, you know, today we'll get into some of the politics of teaching culture, the practical issues, um, and also accessing it from various degrees of cultural knowledge, depending on your perspective and, and lived experience. And so we have a really, really um, all-star lineup for you today, and they're going to introduce themselves, but I'll just give you that little precursor that our moderator is going to be Dr. Brenda Dixon Gottschild, and um, she's going to be joined by three, uh, no, four, sorry, <laughs> four traditional artists. Um, we have uh, Putu Tangas here in Amayema, Alex Shaw, Kermasa Bobo, 
and also Tony Mendez from Los Bomberos de la Calle. So it's gonna be a great conversation. We tried very hard to have a balanced perspective in terms of gender and culture and race and experience on these panels. And I really can't wait to get into it. Um, but without, uh, before I pass that off, I do wanna say a couple of thank yous. I mentioned how this panel's theme came to us, but also I'd like to say a big thank you to our staff and the organizers of this panel our Folk Art and Social Change Fellow, Dr. Eric Cesar Morales, and again, of course, Cinta Penyami Storms, who also you know, brought this to our attention, along with Marus Mitabora, who has been a consultant on the project, and also to our sponsors that make it uh, financially possible. So as I mentioned, we do these workshops as part of our state arts partnership with Pennsylvania Council on the Arts, but this, this topic was so exciting and so um, attractive to so many people that we actually were able to make it into a national conversation, getting support from the American Folklore Society and also urban artistry out of the DC area, um, which is a national street dance organization. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Brenda and to our artists. And I just thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi, for this introduction. And uh, I will take this little moment first that we might thank all the ancestors, all the ancestors, the indigenous people of this land, the enslaved Africans who tilled and cottoned and tobaccoed, and to the Chinese and the Jim Crow African-Americans who built the railroads, for the Filipinos and the other uh, Latinx and, and uh, South Asian people who were working in the kitchens, who were the pool boys and the housemaids and the indentured servants, so to speak. I'm thanking all the ancestors and I'm thanking all the members of the global majority for all that we do, did, and have done for making America great. And I want to then uh, just mention a little bit about this particular panel uh, in uh, some of the PR. Uh, this panel will cover concerns on becoming integrated within a culture? How should we approach a culture that is not our own? When do we feel like we have a right to teach within that culture? How do we create, maintain, and honor cultural lineages? So the panel is gonna engage with some of the practical issues of teaching cultural arts. And of key importance is the recognition that teaching an art form requires cultural knowledge and students are at different levels with varying degrees of access to that knowledge. Some students are native who tacitly understand cultural taboos or protocols. Other students are second generation with more limited familiarity. And then there are those students who have no cultural connection. How can we adapt our teaching to be responsive to each of these needs? And additionally, how do we approach it when we are not directly part of the culture. So we're gonna be deliberating on issues around the politics of teaching, learning and sharing and performing culture as insiders, outsiders and diasporic cultural members. Uh, I, I'll quickly explain what the format is because I want each of these wonderful artists who are here today to introduce themselves. Uh, and they each have about five or so minutes to do so. Uh, so each panelist will show and tell, so to speak, to tell us about them and their work as relevant to the theme of this panel, i.e. negotiating cultural appropriation, lineage, teaching relationships. And um, I've kind of made an order for people to present. Uh, so we're going to begin with Alex Shaw, who's representing of his many talents, uh, the um, Brazilian capoeira background. Uh, he will be followed by Tony Mendez, who uh, represents the bomba and plena of uh, his lineage. 
Uh, and then uh, Kormasa Bobo uh, will indeed uh, speak to and, and show us some Liberian dance. And Putu, Putu Hiran Mayena will indeed uh, demonstrate and talk to us about uh, the gamelan work he's doing. And then I'll come last. Uh, and uh, then we will uh, open it up to a lead question that I think is going to uh, blow open a, a discussion that we will all partake of. So, uh, Alex, can you lead us off? Thank you so much, Dr. Brenda. Uh, my name is Alex Shaw, and I am um, really honored to be a part of this panel here today with um, some friends and new friends as well. Um, I also want to give thanks to Philadelphia Folklore Project for the invitation uh, to have me and, and have some of my voice and insights here um, as a participant in this panel. It's really an honor. Um, I will just try to summarize quickly um, by saying I'm, I am um, uh, an American born in the United States uh, of a um, immigrant mother from China, from Hong Kong, and from a, uh, a white southerner from Florida. And I have uh, grown up in the in the lands uh, in the southwestern Virginia, and um, the 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 Tutelo, uh, indigenous folks from there. Now I live in Philadelphia, uh, home of the Lenny Lenape, and I um, my work a lot of my work in the last twenty or so years has has been around the performance, the teaching, the studying. Um, of, of Afro-Brazilian traditions, specifically Capoeira and Gola, uh, as well as the many varieties of drumming uh, and dance traditions as well uh, from Brazil, um, but not limited to, but that has been my love, that's been um, kind of where I have spent most of my time in my professional uh, career. Um, I work as a teaching artist, I work as a musician, as an instructor, as uh, a community member, um, as a cultural producer. Um, so I have engaged in many ways in the Philadelphia community and beyond around the transmission of, of these cultural art forms and, and hopefully have um, been a, an important part of the strengthening and the awareness of, of the diversity of Brazilian cultural arts, um, Capoeira included. And um, I, I want to, well, I'll, I'll t I can talk later about just a little bit of my journey through that. Um, my my initial, I initially uh, came came into Brazilian music through my love of the music uh, when I was a youth, and um, and it's been a slow but really rich discovery over the years. Um, started training Capoeira Angola in 1998 um, after being introduced to it through uh, an experience at Swarthmore College uh, where I did my undergrad program. And it's been a long journey since um, connecting through that. Um, I have been working as a teaching artist, as I mentioned before, for about 20 years, uh, working in schools all throughout the region and uh, sharing um, some of my knowledge uh, around Capoeira Angola as well as uh, Brazilian drumming traditions and uh, really excited about collaborating um, with all kinds of artists from all kinds of backgrounds. Um, a few years ago, I did complete an MFA program at, uh, in world percussion at California Institute of the Arts uh, under the, the mentorship of Randy Gloss. Um, but I've had many, many teachers along the way, um, many from Brazil, and, and I continue to learn and study and, um, and to share. Um, so I'll leave it at that. We have a, a long list of amazing artists. I don't want to take up too much time, but I would like to leave a, a quick offering. Um, this is a very brief excerpt of a recent project that I've been a part of called Revivals of Blackness um, that was commissioned by World Cafe Live. Um, and it was a collaboration with Leela Aisha Jones, Luke Carlos O'Reilly, and Aiden Un, and myself as the primary collaborators. And uh, this this um, short excerpt I wanted to share with you is in the traditional Capoeira Angola, the song form uh, known as La Dainha. And it is a, uh, it's tr tr traditionally um, would be ritually done at the beginning of a hoda, at the beginning of a game of Capoeira. Um, and uh, this is a La Dainha that I composed. Um, sort of based off of um, um, my experience in, in navigating a lot of the 
the challenges of today and today's society, particularly around anti-blackness in this country. And for those of you not familiar with Capoeira, I'll briefly say it's an African-Brazilian martial art with a very rich legacy of cultural resistance against oppression. So it's very much in line with that. Um, so I will, um, this this video that I'd like to share with you is is this uh, La Dainha, A Luta Sempre Continua, which is the struggle will always continue. And uh, hopefully there'll be little um, cl um, cl captions so that you can read translations if you are so interested. I'm going to sh screen share now. It's about two and a half to three minutes long. so much. I just quickly want to acknowledge the older gentleman in the video is Meshi Pashtia, who is considered the kind of the godfather or the, the you know, the, the top of the lineage for contemporary Capoeira Angola tradition. I am of the Fika um, tradition, so I studied under Meshi Valmi, Meshi Cobramansa, Meshi Juranji, who studied under um, uh, Meshi Moraes, under Juan Grandi, and under Meshi Pashtia. So just wanted to acknowledge lineage there as a part of this, this, this tradition. Uh, thank you very much. I look forward to the conversation conversation to come. Oh, thank you so much. And this whole thing of moving forward by evoking the past and like keeping that, that consciousness. Thank you so much. Um, we move now to Tony, Tony Mendez. All right. Como esta, everybody? I hope everybody's feeling well. Uh, my name is Anthony Mendez. Uh, everyone usually calls me Tony or Mr. Tony uh, with the youth uh, and a lot of the programs that I work at. Um, so I'll bring it back a little bit. I'm originally from um, New York. I moved out here when I was about 18 years old. Um, you know, I was one that didn't know about my culture, did not know 
about los Taino, you know, the cultural background of connections of La Bomba, lo Africano, right? So um, it was uh, it was an honor to connect with um, some of the groups out here, like uh, Familia Rojas. Um, I've worked with uh, Alberto Pagan. These are just a few of the artists that were locally here in Philadelphia. Um, and once I got a chance to um, get to know a little bit more connecting, especially with Maribel Lozada, that's another name um, I should mention out there. Um, uh, these are everyone that I have collaborated, learned from. Um, you know, I didn't realize the large uh, um, background of what this music is, right? The La Bomba, La Plena, and, uh, and definitely La Bomba because it has this much more older essence and, and, and much more closer connection to Africa and Lotaino all around the Caribbean. Um, so, you know, it, it was an honor to get into this. And I think after a while of, of learning from them and, and going, you know, to Puerto Rico and taking work, workshops uh, where I can because I, I was very uh, new to the scene. So um, I knew I was Puerto Rican, but I didn't write I, I wasn't sure about what that meant per se. Um, so uh, I dug deep, you know, I dug deep and I, I connected with who I can. And, and through that one person to the next, it was, you know, I, I was able to connect with many others. And, and it's been a great um, great honor and now um, you know I've left my regular work that I used to do and I, I've been a teaching artist for I would say about nine years I'm the director of a local music band called Los Bomberos de la Calle uh, we do many community events we teach about la historia right the history of what Bomba en Plena is um, uh, and and just overall enjoying the time with the people, right? Bringing this positivity, uh, connecting the young ones out here, right? We had many hurricanes um, in Puerto Rico. We had families come out here and some of the young ones either, they were still young and haven't had the chance to experience La Bomba or La Plena or maybe some of the families or the parents remember this music and just us being able to have a chance to share that with them and working with the young ones and teaching the dance, teaching the traditional songs and, you know, just bringing something positive to, to, to their day, especially with everything that's happening now. And, and of course, it's just things have been getting more uh, challenging and challenging for all the communities. So, but, you know, we always need something positive and, you know, Bombay's, you know, once it has connected to me, I think this is something that, was needed right because i was one growing up 20 something years old i had no clue again i was puerto rican what is bomba what is plena what is the tainos what is you know so once i found out all these connections too you know it was like this was it you know i i think i'm something's here you know i'm destined to do something like this and then i have a great connection with the young ones and you know it's it, it's amazing to see the little ones drumming and dancing and just enjoying the time and keeping up with these traditions and you know not just if you're puerto rican you know because the music is for all this is the music of the people for the people you know and and, and it's a gathering you know and and um we all need this so but i've been blessed to be able to share this music to to be the director of uh, you know the group that we have and 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 work in the programs and 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 you know been blessed to continue to preserve uh, la cultura de la bomba en plena this cultural music from from puerto rico so um i think uh that's just some information i think i have a lot more to share maybe in a little bit but i would love to share una canción that i have here that i usually share with my my students one that i've created um talking about the instruments of la bomba so i hope everybody enjoys this is called un barril okay um and then after i'm done singing uh, and playing the music i'll explain what this means so everybody understands gracias we hope you guys enjoy <clears throat> un barril con un cua, una maraca pa' gozar. Yo te traigo a ti la bomba pa' que vengas a bailar. Un barril con un cua, una maraca pa' gozar. Yo te traigo a ti la bomba pa' que vengas a bailar. Bailame la bomba mamá, repícame la bomba papá, suena los barriles mi gente que la bomba va a sonar, un barril con un cuá, una maraca pa' gozar, yo te traigo a ti la bomba pa' que vengas a bailar, ahí vamos a gozar con mi gente, los boricuas están presentes, mira los bailadores como tira los piquetes, un barril con un cuá, una maraca pa' gozar. 
Yo te traigo a ti la bomba Pa' que vengas a bailar Un barril con un pan Una maraca pa' gozar Yo te traigo a ti la bomba Pa' que vengas a bailar Ay, yo traigo la cultura De mi labor y que yo quiero bailar mi bomba con la punta de mi pie, un barril con un cuan, una maraca pa' gozar. Yo te traigo a ti la bomba, pa' que vengas a bailar. Pa' que vengas a bailar. Pa' que vengas a bailar. Ajá. Pa' que vengas a bailar. Bomba. Uy. Gracias, gracias. So, un barril. What is a barril? Un barril. This is the bomba drum. Barril de bomba, right? A lot of people get it confused as it's a conga, but this is a barrel in español, right? We call this barril. So, un barril con un qua. The qua is the two sticks, which the Tainos used to use back in the day. Something similar called the Mayo Huacan, right? And now we use it in, in La Bomba that we play today. So, uh, in La Bomba se llama qua. It's the two sticks that we used to add a little accent, right, to, to the barrel. And then, of course, la maraca, otro, in, otro instrumento that we use um, uh, that belongs to the Tainos. And I've created this song because it's something easy for everyone to understand, right? What are the instruments that are used in La Bomba? So it's a piece of La Cultura, and, and everybody can sing to it. And, you know, because a lot of the students and a lot of people are like, ah, oh, escucha esa tambor, or let's go and dance. But we lose the sense of what it is, right? And, and, and what the originality of what the music is and understanding the components of the music and that's why you know this is a una canción that i had put together for everybody and you know definitely traditional songs that we sing and enjoy the time with everybody in la comunidad and you know it's about um keeping our spirits up and preserving la cultura and, and, and sharing with everybody and again it's a pleasure to be here with all these amazing amazing artists that are here and and thank you again uh the Philadelphia Folklore Project for uh, um, having me here. I've I've seen you guys and the work you do many times, but I think this is uh, uh, one of the first collaborations we have. So gracias for for um, inviting me here and and, and appreciate uh, hearing from everyone else here. So gracias, mi gente. Uy. Moving forward by evoking the past and this whole sense of you know who we are has so much to do with where we came from and finding those links. Thank you so much, Tony, Mr. Tony. And now uh, I will turn to Kormasa Bobo. Yes. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here on this show. Oh, thank, you. thank you for the Devil Folklore Project. I really appreciate this. Um, my name is Kormasa Bobo. I'm from Liberia, West Africa, and I came from the Loma tribe from Lofa County. Um, I've been dancing from the time I remember five years old. With my father, Kurba Bobo, he had a little small dance group. And I remember dancing with him in Lofa County, it was one of the day with the list president Tava saw us dancing and he invited us, he invited me to, um, to the Liberian National Culture Dance Troupe. Um, I started to dance with the National Dance Troupe in Liberia, we travel all around Liberia, all the different countries. Then from there, um, we came, I came with the National Dance Troop in America and to take part in uh, 1984 Louisiana warfare. And then also travel around America, like places like New York, 
um, Baltimore, you know, it's all the places. And ever since, um, I stayed in Philadelphia. Well, I went home and then came back. And I stayed in Philadelphia. Um, you know, I was blessed that with the Philadelphia Folklore Project helped me. I've been teaching. Thank God for that. I've been teaching school, public school, community center. I've been, uh, you know, teaching children and uh, adults. Um, you know, so performing. And uh, we have a little video here that you can take a look at. And this video, um, one of the dance I'm doing there is a little bit of moonlight dance. You know, when the moon shining in, in my little village, in my town, what, you know, young people come out to dance. So that's the little click of that moonlight dance I'm doing there. <laughs> Thank you. So I think we move along now to Utu Hiran Mayena. And uh, we'll love to hear your, um, your introduction and uh, then we'll move along. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Dr. Brenda. Hello, everyone. Man, this, this panel already has me super fired up and I think that's coupled with the 27 glasses of tea that I just drank. So apologies if I'm going 87 miles an hour. Anyway, again, thank you so much for inviting all of us and especially um, moderating. And this panel again is an awesome lineup. I'll speak briefly before showing my video. Uh, my name is Putu Tangkas Hiran Mayena. Um, I'm generally from the island nation of Indonesia and specifically from the islands of Java and Bali, but I've, I grew up in the United States in uh, middle of the United States, Colorado. So uh, very, very different uh, climates all around in every sense of the word. Um, I, my research and uh, practices are in Indonesian traditional musics and contemporary musics, um, generally called gamelan. And specifically, I'm a scholar and uh, a composer of death music. So a kind of gamelan called Balagandur um, and Anklum, which we can talk more about later. Um, but I currently hold a couple of faculty positions um, at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs and Metropolitan State University of Denver, where I teach music and ethnography and art. Um, but I've also um, had a, a long history of teaching K through 12 schools um, across the United States and in Indonesia as well, and, and um, upholding programmatic directorships across, uh, in communities uh, outside of academic institutions as well. Um, so I wanna set up this clip just a little bit before because I, I don't wanna talk too much about uh, the specifics of who I am, but I do wanna show you how complicated things are uh, in its, artistic form sometimes and this is usually where where my most of my language comes out but this video that I'm going to show you is a 
an arrangement of a uh, heavy metal tune that I actually arranged for um, gamelan balaganja, so for Balinese gamelan. Um, and this particular kind of music, kind of gamelan, is actually traditionally used as uh, cremation music or crem for cremation ceremonies in Indonesia, right? So we have cremation music in the form of a heavy metal tune performed at a jazz club by a majority white community, okay? So that's, I'm gonna give you all of that to say that that's where we're starting. <laughs> So the last thing I will say briefly is that uh, along aligning with my specialties here, uh, noise is very important for Indonesian people. And uh, it, it wasn't very uh, coffee shop friendly tune. So um, anyway, <laughs> thank you all again. Go ahead, Whoa. Doctor. Wow. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all. Talk about being fired up by this panel. It's just such an incredible, beautiful feast, beautiful feast. And uh, I've um, put myself at the end. Uh, my um, uh, place in all this is a little bit different from all of you, besides the fact that I'm old enough to be your grandparent for all of you. But besides that, so I'm going to do what I frequently do in my little moment. I'm going to time myself is uh, I'm going to begin with a poem. And this poem is not mine. Uh, it's a ghazal which is an Arabic word for a poem of, a, a love poem that's also sad or also includes some mel melancholy. So this ghazal was written by Alicia Ostreicher, who happens to be an American Jewish feminist uh, who's uh, in her 80s now. It's called America the Beautiful. And I think it fits right in with all this. Do you remember our earnestness, our sincerity in the first grade when we learned to sing America the Beautiful 
along with the Star Spangled Banner and say the Pledge of Allegiance to America, we put our hands over our first grade hearts. We felt proud to be citizens of America. I said, one nation invisible until corrected. <laughs> Maybe I was right about America. School days, school days, dear old golden rule days, when we learned how to behave in America, what to wear, how to smoke, how to despise our parents who didn't understand us or America, only later learning the banner and the beautiful live on opposite sides of the street in America. Only later discovering the nation is divisible by money, by power, by color, by gender, by sex. America, we comprehend it now, this land is two lands, one triumphant bully, one still hopeful America, imagining amber waves of grain blowing in the wind, purple mountains, and no homeless in America. Sometimes I still put my hand tenderly on my heart, somehow or other still carried away by America. And I must say, being on this panel today, this is the America that I'm carried away by. And this is America, of course. My um, issues with uh, teaching and dealing have all come from the fact that my area has been very specifically, after having been a, a dancer and a, um, an actor in New York, then going into research and writing books that were considered very um, controversial uh, amongst the white, middle-class, largely female, dance culture elite, the scholars of the 1960s and 70s. So this is my first book, Digging the Africanist Presence in American Performance, Dance and Other Contexts. And yes, that's the young Rennie Harris on the cover. I had a hard time getting it published. Things got maybe a little bit easier by the time I wrote my second book, African American Dancing, Waltzing in the Dark, African-American Vaudeville and Race Politics in the Swing Era. And you can tell that I was ruffling some feathers by these titles and bringing this kind of knowledge into uh, the academic establishment, which was all white, largely. Here's the third book, The Black Dancing Body, a geography from Kuhn to Pool. And obviously I'm playing with the fact that, you know, we like to play with the ideas of the blackness and still keeping black people at the bottom though. And then this was my last and most recent book, really right about Philly. And it's all about the history of black dance in Philly and Joan Myers Brown and all of the women who were black who wanted to be ballerinas back then, that's Joan Myers Brown there in the 1940s and 50s. And still ballerinas of color, black ballerinas that is, are still fighting to find their place in the whole American mix. So uh, I guess what I'm saying is that I'm somehow glad that I have stayed the course and lived so long that these books are now used in uh, programs, dance programs across the nation, although many still question the right for uh, black popular entertainment or hip hop or what have you to be taught in academia and still question the idea of, a, uh, of black ballerinas being on stage. So uh, that's my little bit.
And I will now have us move on to a little bit of time for talking. And I'm not sure if we will actually break into um, breakout groups. We have a small group of participants here. So folks, I think we can just actually keep our conversation going with us and with our, our small audience. And actually, um, I hope that uh, Cinta or Naomi will be able to um, uh, field questions that come in that we can then ask in the group. So the first question that I have is the question, <laughs> if and whoever wants to begin now can begin. It doesn't have to be in the same order. If one of you can give one specific example of a problem you've faced being exactly who you are and the teaching and performing your genre, uh, this might be a problem with funders or with students, with facilities, or any population that has questioned who you are and why or how you do what you do. Like that's one of the things that came up for me teaching in the doctoral program at Temple. It was like, what is this black woman doing? You know, being my professor while I'm getting a dissertation done. So question like that. One specific example of a problem you have faced. Now, also you might choose to reverse this question so that you might be asking the question of why others are teaching or appropriating your genre when you feel they aren't qualified. Like uh, Putu, I thought of when you were doing the, um, the gamelan work that I would be offended if a non-Indonesian did what you were doing with your music. And I, I don't know, you know, I, I don't know how your traditional community responds to this or, you know, with Alex. Uh, I'm not sure how and how long it took for the Capoeira community to in, embrace you, Alex. But so those kinds of issues, if anyone wants to start and um, just if we can understand how this became a problem for you, how you're dealing with it, any suggestions for how society at large could help resolve this. And we can just talk back and forth now. Anyone who wants to begin. Thank you, Tata Brenda. Yes, um, um, yes. Uh, that I have uh, the problem that I have with that. Um, I see that my work has not be um, respected. Huh. Uh huh. And I also feel that has not be. You know, some people. Some people have never really valued what I, you know, my talent, uh, okay. my, you know, work, the work I do. Yes. I feel that uh, people, certain people have never really valued it. Yeah. And they have not respecting, you know, what I'm doing. Yes, yes. And... Have you found um, in the classroom with your, the students, some of the students that you're teaching? Not the students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the problem is what I look at. The problem would be is uh, you know like people call me to go perform to a wedding. Uh huh. Um. Then you know I will ask them you know what they can you know what I can what I I, I ask them and how, how much they can pay me, and they would tell me. Oh, I'll give you so, so, so well first of all, I give you my price. Uh -huh. And then they oh, that's too much money. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yes, that's a lot. Yeah. But then I, I was tell them the reason I'm asking for this amount that I have my transportation and you know, coming back and everything. Mm -hmm. But then later on, you know, they would say, Oh, I'll just give you this. This is what I got to give you. Okay, because I love my work. Yeah, I enjoy doing what I'm doing, yeah. and I like for people to see it. Yeah. So I accept it, and then we go. Mm -hmm. And then if it is a wedding, they're gonna just um, I be running around. You know, where can I change my clothes? You know, <laughs> then they will tell me they will end up to cut matter short. 
the way Anna telling me, oh, there's a bathroom right there. <laughs> sometimes if, he, if it is, sometimes if it's the main bathroom, you know, yeah, yeah. and then I would just try manage it some kind of way to get yeah. dressed. Yeah. Then after the, after the performance, and, and if they pick me up to go to the show, after the show, they're done with me. I don't know how to get back home. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I look at that like no respect mm. and then no value. Right. But they, they love it. They want to, they like, they like the work. But, and, and I'm, just a quick question. I like the, the uh, area that you touched on, Kormasa, uh, and I hope I can get uh, the others to respond to these ideas about the respect and the value, which then also do come with a price. Like we are not out there simply doing it as a labor of love, though that is what our work is, but certainly it deserves, it, it has a price. And I'm just wondering, does this happen with uh, Liberians or not? Everyone. <laughs> That's terrible. That's terrible. I thought, you know, it's like, no, your own people know better, you know, or, or somebody does or whatever. Okay. So it's, well, it's not like uh, some people value you more or less than others. Yeah, and let me come. Let me clear that part. Up. Um, when I said everyone, certain people like like the folklore project. Yes, they really appreciate this project. Yeah, yes. the the value. I see the value. Yes, but like you know, other than that, a lot of people. I mean, few people with value, but um, uh, more people are not valuing. You know, they want to work. They like yeah. it. Yeah. But they don't respect it and they don't value it. Yeah. So I have a problem with that. Yes, yes. Does anyone want to uh, weigh in on that as well as any of your thoughts about the, the whole large question? But particularly in this uh, area of respect and value for what it is you do. I can jump in if, if no one else is just briefly. Um, a lot of ideas going on in my head right now and a lot of thoughts, obviously, as I'm sure many of us have. But one of the things that has become somewhat of... I, I, all right, first, I want to get my cynicism out of here and I will say that human beings are arrogant. Ultimately, they're going to want to do whatever they want to do, right? Uh, and also, the really the only universal definition of culture that we have is that no one has a good definition of culture. All right. So we don't even, and I think part of that is, is the beauty of it because then you start thinking about uh, how this term and this idea reflects uh, context and community, right. And really is, you can't really mold one sort of theoretical model or one idea and apply it to somewhere else. You might have strains of it that apply, right. But for the most part, you just have to kind of be, malleable in these kinds of ways. And so something that um, I was thinking about as this panel was getting drawn together is that there tends to be a narrative of cultural appropriation where we talk about an us versus them kind of kind of uh, storyline, right? Where it's like, here's, here's uh, in, so, in sociological terms, right? The emic or etic perspective, right? The insider versus outsider. Yeah, yeah. But at what point at what point are we talking about those those moments where you're actually having inner cultural appropriation? So inner, not inter, but inner. So mm -hmm. being of a presumed or assumed culture and having those values um, assumed or presumed, right? So for example, um, one of the things that I've come across uh, uh, in my experience has been that like, most of the cultural appropriation that I um, experience has actually been by my own community, uh, it, my own Indonesian community, but not to their not to the fault of their own. It's the Indonesian diaspora in the United States, more specifically, right? There's a lot of pressure of um, upholding a certain kind of, of worldview when you don't have a good model of what that worldview is, because we're all, even in terms of a minority, 
we are a minority within a minority. So there hasn't been much representation in, in the context of Indonesian peoples, right? And so when you're appointed by a community, which, which gets deeper in complexities, like which community is appointing you as cultural ambassador, right? Is it the Indonesian community or is it actually the community that you're in that really has nothing to do with Indonesian-ness, right? Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of moments where, for example, and I deal with music, right? So for, for the most part, where it's it's a little intangible and it's hard to say what exactly is being appropriated. It's a little harder to grasp what exactly is as opposed to something like regalia or something that's visual, right? Where you can blatantly see like, oh, that's, that's kind of directly cultural appropriation because you're using regalia as a costume um, or something like that. But in, in the context of uh, a lot of Indonesian musics and Indonesian communities in this country, uh, in the country of the United States, it's, it's like, okay, I'm the only Indonesian person in my community Mm -hmm. um, and I'm uh, expected to uphold a certain kind of image about Indonesia filtered through how you think the United States should look at certain things, right? And so there's this dynamic that happens where it's, it really does become very regional, right? And it really does become um, a, a topic about general uh, culture, cultural processes and specific, right? So I can say I'm Indonesian generally, right? But specifically, I come from the island of Bali and Java, which have very different cultural processes, even within themselves. But to someone outside of Indonesia, those might be the same things, right? So a lot of the times I experience um, having to talk to my own peers and talk to my own Indonesian community as being like, hey, some of the things that you're wearing are actually very sacred and can't be just you just can't use this thing for this kind of music even though sometimes they get conflated and it's it, sometimes it's all about image right and it's it's about um how do we present ourselves but at the same at the same time there's some turmoil even within right because there's a lot of pressure coming from different directions that we're all just trying to navigate and there's a concept in bali called desa kalapatra which is time situation and context and the gist of it is essentially that you find yourself in a different place, different time, different context, and you just have to adjust accordingly, right? There's no real one correct answer. When in Rome, do as the Romans. Yeah. <laughs> yes, something like that. So uh, a lot of ideas there, but I think that's as much as I can offer right now. But that's so interesting in talking about the, uh, the uh, intra conflict and that you brought up Putu, the uh, whole idea of like an, uh, an edict or an emic perspective, like the edict being uh, if you bring like uh, all those people who so much love um, African based everything and will bring their frame of reference to it, not taking into account you know, and, and I'm sure Kormasa can speak to this, that Africa is a continent, you know, and there is, it's not that you can bring your frame of reference to what Africa is when there is the need to do the kind of thing that Alex has done with, uh, in his Afro-Brazilian um, uh, excursions, which is to uh, immerse yourself, and that's the emic perspective, immersing yourself within the culture and, and a specific Brazilian culture, as he mentioned, and he mentioned his lineage in a specific culture in order to be able to understand it. Then maybe when you're teaching it, you're not the foreigner, you know. I'm still interested in, in this, um, uh, th th interesting that you, you said, Putu, that you can see most of the uh, appropriation with costume but I bet, again, because that's sort of what I talk about in my books is how much you see the appropriation in, in music and dance as well, that you can really kind of sort those things out, you know, like I did that looking at uh, American ballet and talked about all the Africanisms in American ballet, for example, you know. Okay, let me shut up and uh, let's just open it. Tony, Alex, Bobo Putu, whoever wants to jump in. You know, uh, jump in 
in what was just mentioned, you know, that, that respect portion um, of, of, you know, being called for like a gig, you know, and, and, and um, depending if it is that inner or that outer, right, you kind of see the differences in between. Um, we've gotten calls where, you know, there's an all Caucasian or we're having like a party with, you know, Lo Italiano, you know, and we have, we're doing many different cultures and you can see where, where some of the outer, I, I would guess in my cases, you know, show a little bit more respect of, um, and then the inner, you know, I don't know if it's because it's the daily living of what they have. And I mean, I wouldn't say it, it, there's no misinterpretation or disrespect of, I just guess there's more uh, appreciation coming from an outsider from what I witnessed uh, for the many years that I've been presenting and, and just teaching in general than all the time that, that, that inner or that, uh, um, that inner circle of those people. Right. Um, but I think it's very important um, that people understand that work that goes behind, uh, you know, us as teaching artists and, and those that are sharing their culture to anyone, whether it's in the schools, whether it's you get a call for a gig, you go into a wedding, you go in, you know, it, it's yeah. important yeah. that everyone understands, like, you know, the work that goes into it. And, and you know, for some of us, it's, it's our daily living, right? It, we, we, we live it, we breathe it, we eat it. It's, it's every day. It's with us, right? Um, and, and we have those other situations, of course. I'm pretty sure we'll get into that conversation about others, you know, on the, uh, a little bit more on the outside and, and, and the kind of doing things and not going through the correct routes that they should um, if they are to present this culture in, in, in the way it should be presented, um, you know, uh, but I think, um, you know, it, it has its up and downs. And for me, I think it's uh, the, the lack of education, right, that people may have. Like, oh, let me call these guys. They're, they're amazing. Look at the way they dance or look at, let me call her, let me, but they don't see the much deeper part of 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 that that background right that lineage i don't think i was here the last time you guys uh spoke about that but definitely you know understanding that and the work that goes with some of these teaching artists you know they go above and beyond you know you see you know you see the heart you see the work and 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 it definitely uh that respect is needed um across the board but when there is not respect sometimes there's a lack of knowledge that that goes into understanding what that culture is or just uh um you know everybody just trying to save a penny in some cases you know but mm. you know you know your worth you know you know the work that you put into it and definitely you know um if you're giving the people the love and the passion that goes behind that culture también right uh, um definitely as an artist you should be taken care of right and of course we all give back to our community i know i do we do many performances for free for you know, we have amazing things happening right and i'm pretty sure everybody does you know but it's just understanding you know uh, uh, um that the work that is put into it we this is our every day you know for some of us this is all we do you know and 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 we want to be respected and of course when time is due compensated accordingly for 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 uh, the love and the passion that, that, that we put into that. So um, those are my few cents. Gracias. <laughs> Thank you, Tony, so much for sharing that. I wanted to, to offer something, um, an idea from experience. Um, and I'll try to be specific, but also be a little bit general as well, um, without naming names. But um, so I'm thinking back to a time with my Capoeira group. Um, you know, we, we are sometimes hired uh, to perform for fees and sometimes we are hired to uh, or just just participate in, in you know public spaces and street fairs etc and um, probably near close to 20 years ago um, I think there's still an echo here maybe Tony would you mind muting uh, yeah cool. I got you my apologies no problem thanks you bro um, so so maybe close to 20 years ago um, there was a conversation in the group because the group was going to perform for a street festival that was really, you know, sort of traditionally about uh, African and black culture here in Philadelphia and uh, an annual festival. And the group, um, which at the time and continues to consist of, you know, it's, it's a mixed background, you know, some, some are of African descent and some are not. Um, and there was a conversation about whether this particular demonstration or performance are, you know, what we call Hoda, um, should just be for holding space for the black members of the group. 
And it was a very complex conversation because we were all, you know, we we're all in the group together. But there was this added layer of what does it mean to um, to learn, to study, to be a practitioner of uh, an African diasporic um, uh, tradition and culture. Um, and to be in this specifically in this culture in, in, in the United States to be uh, of African descent, black and African descent in this culture. What does it mean to hold space um, versus, you know, other people who were maybe just as dedicated, uh, such as myself, I'm not of African descent, but just as dedicated and committed to the group and to the tradition. Um, what does it mean to hold space for those? And, and it was quite controversial um, within the group. Nobody really outside. It wasn't a public conversation, but even with uh, there was even, you know, dissent between our teachers and uh, people coming from a, a Brazilian perspective um, where racial politics, uh, there's a lot of parallels, but there are also a lot of differences in terms of this, this notion of who is in, who's out, et cetera. Um, and it, you know, it, there, was, uh, there were fractures in the group and, and as a result, some people did leave the group um, at that time. Um, it's a different group today and, and many things have changed and I was I was relatively young in the group So I don't have a lot of details. I don't I don't think I was privy to is all the specific conversations But I do remember that being quite an interesting conversation and it wasn't about um, You know an outside institution p Policing or patrolling or respecting it was really this uh, this notion of you know, how do we as 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 fellow practitioners? How do we hold space in, in these different contexts? Uh, for you know, to honor where this tradition comes from, which which is really born out of uh, cultural resistance to slavery, what had developed in Brazil, you know, a couple hundred years ago, um, connect, connected to, to specific cultural traditions from the Congo, Angola region, and Central Africa, but under the conditions of slavery in colonial Brazil, what had developed as this form of resistance, as a form of liberation, and it continues to exist and has struggled for many, many, many years and many generations, and it's only been uh, from the perseverance of, of our teachers and our lineages that have been able to maintain Capoeira to a place where today it's celebrated internationally. But, you know, over a hundred, not, not so long ago, you could be jailed for training training Capoeira. So what does it mean to, to, to hold this legacy and to participate in this legacy and to understand the struggle and understand the, the, the role in which it has played in both the demise and the liberation of many people? Um, and so how, how do those legacies, how do those traditions, you know, get carried forth in contemporary spaces and non-Brazilian spaces and the spaces, United States and Philadelphia specifically, where it's a black city and, and uh, you know, how do we hold space? So lots of layers here. And I just, I think there's a lot of intersections with, with what Puto was, uh, Puto was, was um, mentioning and, and with Tony as well. And I know this conversation is also supposed to be about uh, our teaching artist practice, which I think is, is, is informed by these lived experiences that we have as practitioners. Um, but I just wanted to share some of the complexities of what it, what it means to be practicing these, these diasporic forms in these, uh, yeah, in, in, in these global communities. So capoeira, or let us say in that general sense, African dance, you know, or um, Puerto Rican music, right? or Indonesian music becomes commercialized. And of course, in a sense, you want to be able to earn a living the way the, the uh, symphony orchestra uh, double bass player is and the way the uh, ballet artistic director is, if you will. Uh, still, this issue though of if your uh, particular form uh, is to thrive in uh, the capitalist America that we exist in. Uh, it has to be commercialized. Uh, it has to be packaged. Uh, it has to be sold in a certain sense. Uh, I'm just wondering how, as teachers, how do you deal with that in your classes? How do you deal with that? I'm thinking also about Bobo, you know, your in incredible, uh, your outfits. And, uh, you know, it's like, this is you. And this then, means one thing from the inside or from me even looking at it, you know, than it does from a quote unquote, an outsider who sees you and says, oh yeah, that's African, what have you. How are you dealing with being in 2021, coming out of a pandemic, coming out of, you know, as you said in your song, Alex, you know, Trevor, uh, 
Eric Garner, George Floyd, uh, Crawford, all of the, how does it, how are you dealing with keeping your integrity, your history, when you still have to, as Mr. Tony mentioned, you still have to, you know, pay the rent, do get the bucks. I, th I think this is a really good point because, you know, where we are largely in a global capitalist society and have been in a, for a really long time. So as Cormasa was saying earlier, you know, the things that we do, even if it is uh, a labor of love, we do have to uh, uh, attribute some kind of monetary value in order to put food on the table, in order to survive, in, especially in a country that thrives off capitalist systems, right? And unfortunately, we are in, in those moments now where we can't just do things um, for love or as a favor, right? Like I'm sure all of us have had uh, a call to do a gig for exposure, right? And it's like, yeah, I got enough exposure. Like we can, <laughs> we can do that ourselves, right? That's a very DIY thing. And yeah, like appreciate the gesture, but we'd appreciate more of a gesture if you offered uh, uh, some, some monetary uh, supplements beforehand instead of us having to string things out. Um, but where I'm going with this is that something like uh, the, the something like why the Indonesian arts are even in the United States or why I'm even living in the United States, those kinds of things have to do with histories of um, colonial endeavors that are collaborating with the with with uh, uh, local governments, right? Local meaning Indonesian governments working to be more cosmopolitan or have a conversation in the global worldview. But in doing so, a lot of like global music ensembles are situated in academic institutions, right? And that's where the patronage comes from. That's where the funding comes from and things like that, right? So for why I wanted to bring that video in, in the introduction and sort of uh, explaining why there's a largely white community playing Balinese music is because a lot of those members, even if, if it's a community group, a lot of those members have come in through exposure to gamelan through ac academies, right? Through academic institutions. And Alex, you mentioned being at Cal Arts, and I, I don't know if you studied with Pat Wenton at all or saw the Balinese gamelan, but that, you know, that happens there. They're, there's, uh, it's not just an isolated incident, right? There's the reason gamelan in the United States is a white activity is because of this access to academic institutions. And unfortunately, as much as I want to just burn the whole system down, it's like, well, I got to try and uh, put sustenance into my skinny body. So to survive for another day, <laughs> those kinds of things. So, you know, this is just a specific, one specific context, but I'm sure uh, many of us can attest to that, right? Uh, good question. Is for me, is it's tough. It's a really tough thing to deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, before even the pandemic, this is the life I have. This is, you know, this is what I live on. Yes. In, in, in Abira, in the national troop performing, and, you know, that's, that's it. And coming here, you got a package but you don't know where to sell it. So, um, you know, promotional one, and then, um, I mean, the folklore trying, really, but financially it's tough to get a finance. Um, then the pandemic came in uh, to teach, because I don't know, I probably didn't measure by the teaching earlier, because I teach, you know, the, the folklore are really been helping me to teach in schools, community center. And, but um, with the pandemic coming in to go out there and teach, it been tough. Um, if, you, if you go to the classroom to teach sometime, you need like uh, another person to be there with you, with the kids. Um, sometimes somebody will tell you, well, um, yes, it, yes, the classroom, yeah, the students, you can go out and teach now what I need assistance to help me with, this, with the students, not just me. Okay. 
Um, that's also something I need to be kind of not, not teaching dance, especially for me, I, I love teaching the young people. They like children from like five years up, you know, like that's what, that I love to teach little one. So in there, I always like to have assistant teacher with me, somebody to be with me in the classroom. But sometimes it's hard um, to, for, the, for the teacher to have you somebody to, to help you with it. So yeah, those are the difficulty, uh, you know, that to deal with that is a little bit frustrating in that way, uh, financially. Like this is something that I have not been um, doing with no, no, um, you know, um, no, no support like financially. Gonna live on it. I was taking pay every month when I was in Africa. When I here, I had to drop everything what I love doing. I gotta leave it and then go out there to do something else that that I never done before. So yeah, it's difficult. It's kind of really frustrating on that. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the teaching space is challenging. Um, you know, I know that's one of the main things. Um, and, and again, it's going back to the respect um, of, you know, of, of that teaching artist. And, and I know um, Kumasa, correct? Did I say that correct? Kumasa? Um, it, you know, being in, being in the classes and just being one person, right, and not having that assistant available. I work with one of the dancers. So uh, the music that I teach is not just Puerto Rican. I wanted to, it's Afro-Puerto Rican también. So it's Afro-Puerto Rican bomba. Um, so it has that, that background of, and I have the dancer that teaches with me in the classes. And it does make things a lot easier and we're able to transition. You know, some of the students, half of the class, we do el baile, the dance, and the other half, we do the percussion, we're singing canciones, right? But as far as connecting, and when we're talking about um, having that respect and getting it from organizations that that um, that especially if the neighborhood right if the neighborhood is full of Latinos or depending of that culture whether it is or whether it's not um, it's it's just understanding how having this sense of uh, of showing the respect excuse me for that teaching artist that's giving that art and and being able to again compensate them accordingly you know um, if, you know if you needed help i think th for me i appropriate that into like the contract when i connect with some of these com collaborations and again it can be a challenging um sometimes for even receiving that funding or keeping things consistent and you know um again the help in the classroom is it's it can it can have its ups and downs depending on what organization that you are working with, and I've worked for several organizations where they showed much much respect uh, uh, for w what we do, and you know I I would do anything in the world for these people, you know, and and then you have the other ones that you know are part of this community are are supposed to be giving back to the community and finding a space to have ensayo and finding a space to have give community classes you know even with those own organizations that are involved in those part of those communities that are in need of this um it, it sometimes can be a, a difficult challenge and again it goes back to respect uh, um, and 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 understanding how much work some of these artists are putting into it, you know, some some of us give our every day. You know, uh, uh, I know I have a large family, and they call me for boom bam. I'm, I'm there, you know. They they have an after school program and a summer program. I'm there, and we just started one too. And it's you know, with the COVID, has been crazy, and it's been a blessing being in there. Um, the kids are wonderful; they're so excited, you know. And and it. Yeah, I'm excited to be back in there. Of course, we have to be careful, you know, uh, and still continue to be cautious. But, um, you know, it, it has been a challenge as a teaching artist to build collaboration with some organizations, uh, um, even even if they understand kind of that art form that you do. But there's always of, you know, oh, well, if, if we can't give you this, we're going to go ahead and, and get that. And, and what I'm talking about is, you know, and again, I've heard somebody say earlier that they didn't want to mention any names. I'm not going to mention any names. But in some cases, some organizations would rather grab that performing artist YouTuber to replace the real teaching aspect. You know, I've had somebody, we, I've had a gig this past weekend and somebody came to me and, and, oh, I'm the new teaching artist for the Philadelphia School District of Bomba. And I said, oh, 
okay, I, I you know, so I, I, the Bomba community is very tight knit, right? So I, I, we kind of all, maybe we don't all be together, but we know of each other, right? And when this person came to me just out of like this, I'm like, oh, wow. And then one of the dancers that have been dancing, that I've been working with, she's been here in Philadelphia for 25, 30 years working and doing this. Uh, she mentioned to her, she said, the first thing is, where did you learn from? Where did you learn this music from? And that person responded back, oh, I learned it from YouTube. And I said, okay. So I didn't find it out until later, but that was something that I, you know, for me was a disrespect, right? Um, if you are a different tradition, a different culture, a different color, it doesn't matter. You know, if you want to get involved in it, go through the right, go through it the right way, right? Mm -hmm. For me personally, I'm just a small link of a much larger chain, right? So it's important that, that, that you know, that person or even her coming correct in the right way, in the proper way, say, hey, my name is so-so. I've been looking to, you know, study. There's many forms, but the way that it was, and it was a Caucasian woman, so that's the other thing of, you know, it was it was just weird at that moment. And again, I didn't find out that information before. And, 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 um, and that's not the problem of, again, being Caucasian of another race, but going through the right channels, networking, finding who is who, building off of this one and learning more. I'm still a student. I'm still learning. I have so much more to learn. You know, again, I'm just a piece, uh, 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 a link of that much, much larger chain. And I think everybody should should have that respect because when you find those links around, we need to share that. We need to show respect. We need to support. We need to collaborate and build, you know, much more. And of course, definitely, you know, in, in, in that respectful form because everybody has their what's appropriate and what's not right i can do this and can't do that if you do it through me you have to go one two three and again every, again everybody has their their levels and forms of how they need to go across the board to to get more of this information to have a chance to teach even if you are outside mm -hmm. right of, of of that cultural aspect that that's happening so it's really interesting though it's like and then alex for sure but this whole thing that you brought up tony it really is about some of those loaded situations you know and i love how you said that you're just a small link of a larger chain and this sense that yeah you know nobody would think of and this is the thing about value and respect and he, he, you know, world arts here. I'm just thinking nobody would go to an audition for a Bob Fosse Broadway show or something and say, oh, I learned it on YouTube. You know, I mean, you don't, you don't, you know, you don't, the, the respect that traditional um, Eurocentric uh, institutions have, whether it's Broadway or the ballet stage or the traditional modern dance stage, uh, that those things would never be broken. You know, so interesting that, and it's not interesting, it's just something that we all know, I think, who are here, uh, that that is what we are up against, you know, and those are the people still who are getting the great amount of funding. Some little change, we hope, we hope some little wedge has been put in that with the pandemic, with the, um, the fact that uh, people are talking about a different way of understanding American history, which is what I tried to bring up at the beginning here. Uh, we know that it's being fought against, but the whole idea of teaching critical American history so people begin to understand the critical need for all of us who are here as part of American history, you know. Um, please, Alex. There's so many things that are coming to mind. I wanna, I wanna circle back to something you said earlier, Dr. Brenda, around, uh, around this idea of integrity. Um, and, and for me, I think that is a core part, a uh, core value, a core um, intention um, especially being non-native practitioner of, of these forms. You know, what is what is my responsibility that comes with the privilege of, of having access to this information, to having uh, uh, access to, to these communities, to building these relationships, to learning this, this um, these, these uh, rituals that, that come in so many different ways. Um, I think that um, it's really important um, that 
these conversations around around teaching so not just learning or not just performing but if we're talking about activating you know pedagogy spaces and and teaching um what is what are our responsibilities of acknowledging uh our own positionality you know where 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 we benefit from privilege in the various ways whether uh it's white privilege male privilege economic privilege you know economic uh, uh academic etc uh, as as putu had mentioned a lot of especially in the United States, a lot of these traditional forms are being learned in academic spaces um, by predominantly white students who have the economic resources to be in these schools. Where are the conversations, where are the critical conversations that are happening around the responsibilities of learning this material? Because what happens is you have these students that gain access, that spend the time and do it earnestly, that do it in a genuine way. But intention is not always the way you have to you have to you have to marry intention uh you know this this notion of good intentions with actually having an informed practice of integrity so acknowledging lineage is, is one building actual relationships leveraging opportunities uh, and resources that you have access to for other people that don't have access to these things how are you how are you reciprocating this relationship with this information you know i i i Think about institutions like uh, California Institute of the Arts, where I went to school, and incredible offerings, incredible traditions, uh, uh, and so many, and so many, tra so many tra world uh, cultural traditions. Um, and I just want to make sure that in these kinds of spaces, that there are also critical uh, and informed conversations around what does it mean to then become uh, the, the 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 trans, you know, one who transmit these cultural traditions. Right, and not just saying, "Well, I learned it. I have this information. Now I'm going to go and teach it." But what is? Where are you a part of that larger landscape? This, this law, and, and and you know, this this circles back to your conversation around capitalism, and and you know, this I, this notion of needing to make a living. Um, and just because you can, and just because you know, you have to survey yourself and where you are inside of the larger spectrum. It does not necessarily mean that it's for you at that time. I'm not, and this and this is complex and it's layered because it's not always, uh, it's not always a, a hard and fast rule. But I find that the more you open pathways for other people, the more you find ways to collaborate. The, the more you acknowledge the lineages, the more that you, you, you really um, take a step back and and survey what is this space for and who is it for and what at what point is this for. I think it it will come back around. Understanding that it doesn't have to be um doesn't have to be this this deficit you know it can be a rich space and i know that we all struggle especially those of us who are in cultural arts you know this this notion of, of value you know in the capitalist system and you know kormas struggle with being valued and, and getting hired for gigs and being supported and, and treated with respect you know so th there are so many ways in which we exist as teachers as practitioners as students as performers um you know and and so these these relationships are all nuanced, and you have to know when is it time for the, to be an advocate, when is it time for you to step back, when is it time for you to be the one to lead, and uh, these are conversations that we continue to learn from. And I don't always make the I've I've learned so much from making wrong decisions and having very difficult conversations with people who I respect, who I love, and who I know are have my best interests in mind. So I think it's I uh, yeah. The, I just there's so many so many different pieces to this, but serving yourself, acknowledging your own positionality, acknowledging your own privilege, and what is your responsibility with its cultural information. And all of us are coming from different walks of life, but I think I think this is important. This is universal. This goes across the board. I would love to just put in there this idea of what are you giving back, and I mean uh, not necessarily. I mean for all of us. As, as we are, you know, what it is that I'm doing, whatever, whatever, but also, again, for the um, uh, Caucasian person who came up to Tony and said, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I've learned it from YouTube or whatever. Uh, question being, how do you teach somebody, how do you teach a person like that? who approaches you in a certain, and I'm putting this out as a rhetorical question, because there are some questions we have to get to from uh, the attendees, but and rhetorically, how do you deal, each of you, just think about it, with the kind of person who comes up to you with that kind of um, 
uh, um, mindset. Uh, and of course, to me, it's always then about to that person, what are you giving back? I have those kinds of questions coming up to me, especially since uh, the, the uh, incredible murder last year, the whole thing of the George Floyd turning point. I get emails from people like, I won't go into what they are, but basically from an older group of basically um, uh, dominant caste, I would say, um, i.e. white, dominant caste uh, uh, practitioners, basically scholars in dance, who are asking questions about, well, how do I deal with this? And basically, in some sense, I am telling them, how can you think about giving back? How can you think about what your place is in the world that is not centered around white supremacy. How do you, now that you're asking me that question, how do you deploy yourself in such a way that it is not only about you, that you are giving back? Anyway, here are two questions. Let me see, question number one to the artists. How is your art received by your communities? That's the first question. I'll respond to this uh, it, in response to something that Tony has said that really, um, I think will highlight uh, some of the, the reciprocity and some of the reception from communities that I've been in. But Tony, when you're mentioning that in, in your groups where if you don't know something about a certain aspect of the art that you're making, you seek out a specialist, right? Like you are doing the work to go find someone or to actually know someone that has the cultural knowledge to bring that in, right? And I think we live in a, a, a historically globalizing time where there are multiple kinds of people in places like the United States to where attributing value does kind of have to start at a local and regional level first. You know, this is part of the problem with academia too, is that there's, there's these, there's white researchers that go to other countries and try and gain credentials because, oh, I want to go get the authentic experience and learn from the masters over in the other country when it's like, yeah, okay, that's great. But you haven't sought out like the people that are actually in your vicinity. And I think that becomes problematic in itself, right? Because then we're dealing with taking a plane that is uh, across seas. And if you do that multiple times a year, um, you're, you're contributing to the demise of the environment, right? All right, again, cynicism out. <laughs> um, but also this is to say that like, there's, there's, uh, there's this arrogance by, by certain kinds of, of people and af afforded by the medium such as YouTube where, I will say that, you know, YouTube as a technology and as a pedagogical tool is, is kind of like Wikipedia, right? It's like, it's a good place to start, but it shouldn't be the thing that gives you credentials, right? It shouldn't be the thing. It should be like, oh, I found this cool thing. Let me go research it and find, find ways to, to uh, get a deeper knowledge of this thing, right? And so, you know, as I said earlier, I'm, I study death musics. Right? I study music that is tied to death specifically. And in doing so, I think about death a lot, <laughs> which is a little dark, but it, it's, it's, it's a part of life, right? And so sometimes when I think about death, I think about art forms that are dying. And there's this arrogance sometimes by a lot of preservationists that say, oh, this art form is just dying, we have to preserve it. But sometimes that's, that's being purported by people that are outside of that culture, right? Because if you're, if an art form is dying because of a traumatic experience as something and something that is tied to the arts, maybe do, maybe there's a history of like genocide and there's a particular kind of music or dance tied to that. And the community that's living really doesn't want to think about that traumatic experience. Let that thing die, right? Like if the people that were making that art and making that music um, or making that da dance are in a point where that's just too traumatic anymore. Those are things we just 
can't preserve, right? Like if they don't want them to be preserved, then they don't, they shouldn't be preserved. And there's sometimes this arrogance of people like, oh, it's so sad that things are dying, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, what are the contexts in which those things are dying, right? Like I think a lot about that in terms of Indonesian musics and how things get received and why I even like, why I'm bringing a heavy metal thing to a gamelan thing, right? It's like, well, there's certain things where things can develop and you don't need to preserve anything. And who's on whose account are things being preserved? So in doing, in saying all of that, the, the kind of art and the communities in which I work with, I've actually really hadn't had any uh, bad pushback or anything um, with the things that I've created with the communities. Because I think as Alex and Kormaso were saying earlier, the, the intention has to be coupled with the impact, right? Those kinds of things have to be in tandem with each other. And it can't just be good intentions. It also has to be uh, uh, this kind of impact on a community that, that is seen and perceived as, as uh, uh, progressing or something that is not a detriment to the community. Thank you. Intention and integrity. I think that's what Alex said. So yes. And the question again is to the other artists, how is your art received by your communities? Thank you again. Um, my, to me, the community, my Liberian community, the, um, it's not, it hasn't been valued. It hasn't been valued, it hasn't been um, respected. You know, like way back in Africa, I want to say the national dance coming to perform the way people really respected it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, when we go to the island to perform, the play will be crowded and all that. And people value it those days. Mm -hmm. People really value it. We perform for president, you know, um, um, people, tourists will come, they will come and I mean, just to watch us, it will be crowded. Sometimes mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't have space to even walk, space wow. to walk and go see us performing. But now, everything I just be like, it is so frustrating, um, so heartbroken that the, the traditional dance, the culture, there's no value anymore because, and if you start, I can start say from the, from the top, from the top, they just screw, I mean, the whole thing is uh, uh, no respect. In, 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 yeah, in the Liberian community, uh, if you in here, you know, in here in Philadelphia, Finish. more especially for the devil, they don't respect the community because if, if you know at the Kinija my where where I grew up, they are con that the Kinijas are just been like place where they you know remove Kinija and ever send them the culture have no value. Okay, so you you but you're saying in in the Liberian community here in Philly does not value. No. But in Liberia, they it, it is valued. Yes. Yes, okay, all right, wow. Well, yeah, some part of Liberia, you know, like I said, this is the top, like on the um, Kenija, the way they took, the way they remove mm -hmm. Kenija, where all the others were like me, like me, you know, Okay. Um, that came from the top. That came from the, the, the president I that see. took the yeah. job away. Okay. Yeah. So then um, people are doing culture like they don't, they're not, you know, young people uh, have the idea, but they're not, they are not really, they don't know sometimes the, the dances that they're doing, the meaning of it. Yeah. yeah. I know the meaning. Mm -hmm. And they have the, 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 the uh, you know, they got the idea of doing the dances, but they don't know the meaning and they're not doing it the proper way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. You know, so there's, that's another problem right there. Right. In, in, in here in Philadelphia, um, people are really not, you know, like, that's, that, like I said, they're really not valuing it. 
they're American now. I hate to put it this way. They're American now. And you know, when you when somebody hire you that really doing the right properly, that respects you, mm-hmm. and then they come around and see it, they embrace it. Oh, for we haven't seen this for a long time. Oh, I like it. Uh, you know. But then when you hire me to come, you know, respect, respect me. Yeah. And then, you know, show the value of it. Yes. Thank you, Kormasa, for these uh, stories. I mean, it, to me, it's making me think about, you know, this, the, the immigrant experience and assimilation and, 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 the, and this, you know, this proximity to whiteness that, that I think people who come to this country and even growing up in this country, there's this notion, you know, this, this idea of being at, getting access to power and, and, and following and valuing the things that have been valued in these, in these white capitalist systems that we, that we are navigating all the time. So this idea of kind of moving away from, from tradition and from these stories and from these, these uh, meanings and these, these cultural contexts, you know, part of that, that loss, that erasure is, is part of this Americanization of this coming. And I'm not saying it has to be one or the other. It can be both. But oftentimes, you know, people who are coming here are just trying to navigate, you know, through survival or perhaps if they have more economic footing, um, you know, uh, there, it's just this idea of, of you know, trying to, uh, trying to grow and advance your career as such that that is that is within you know certain mainstreams that are within these structures of power and economic privilege so that's one thing i just wanted to respond to and then the other thing just going back to this notion of youtube uh you know i'm old enough that when i first you know as non-native practitioner i first came into brazilian music through uh through albums and and i had no i had no youtube and i'm glad that i didn't have youtube because i think having that ease of access to information would have changed the way in which I value, maybe not me personally, but just thinking about this generally, I had to make a very conscious and intentional effort over years to try to discover my own path and, and understand what was that was so provocative for me. Why, what would, how could I continue to uncover all of these layers through my own discovery and not having immediate access to a teacher or to anything online, you know, but to go through albums and to, you know, at at that time, I, I joined BMG and Columbia House Record, you know, clubs under different names so I could buy every Brazilian album in the, in the catalog because that was the only way in which I could, with my blind eyes, could feel and, and, and get a sense of the room and figure out which walls were connected to which ceilings and floors and how I could do this, you know, orally. And of course, over time, then built relationships and, and brought my my lived experience into those those relationships and those teaching and those studies but youtube like you know it can be a great starting place you know but it can be very deceptive because there's people out there saying that they know this and that xyz and they mislead so many people and it's really unfortunate and you know not to patrol or police all of this but there's no substitute for someone who is respected as a as a as a cultural practitioner who has for generations you know been part of a generational lineage and you know i know i know what it means to be out of reach, you know, for that to be out of reach at times. But at, what is our res- what are our res- responsibilities as teachers too, right? We don't just teach the we don't just teach the rhythms. We don't just teach the, the movements. We also teach what it means. What are the contexts? What does it mean to have this information? What are the lineages that come with that? So that we can, for these next generations, try to try to plant those seeds of respect and that seed those seeds of value so they can understand the languages in which we are speaking with our bodies with our voices and with our spirits when they can understand that and recognize the value of that then they can these young people will then be in positions eventually in power and will be gatekeepers and be making decisions for other people and they will be the ones that can say i had this experience even if that's not what i do for my life this experience changed the way that i see the world and changed the way i see how i can engage with other people that are different from me but i can respect and align with my own lived experience that those those kinds of values so i think that's where the opportunity is and all the teaching that we do not just to give them a dance or a song or a rhythm but what comes with that what is it what does it mean why has it been you know what 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 does it hold today anyway I don't mean to go off. Just wanted to throw. Okay. <laughs> you know, you might as well stay. We don't have much time left, but I want to do a quick round of the second question, and we might as well start, Alex, with you. Question for all of the artists: Do you return to your countries to teach? If not, is this a plan that you have? Just a kind of sixty seconds. 
I teach every I teach all the time here and this is my country but I you know I consider you know I go, go to Brazil a lot as I, I remember a lot too. yes there's yes. so there's opportunities for exchange there you know yeah. maybe not teaching the same way but I I believe in cultural exchange and and that yeah so I'll I'll share that okay so I do know that and uh uh Kormasa do you yes remember? yes of course wonderful yeah. yes I um would love to go back and teach the culture um more especially like here when the refugee children came they didn't mm -hmm. you know they when when uh Liberian community started uh, not to value the culture yeah what was one of the things that they had to deal with them like you know having going picking all the refugee children that that did not have no idea about the culture. So I teach them and they they, they love it. And a lot of them give a positive comment towards it, what I was doing. I make my way, I take my car and drive around, pick them up. That's how I work with them, you know, pick them up and teach them, then drive them off to their very home. And I'm blessed that they, I was blessed by the parent trusted me with all of their children. And I did that for over five years, more than five years, I was doing the teaching them, the, the, the young people from the Liberian community, because most of the time I talk to them, what they tell me was they remember somebody killing somebody, they're walking over their body, you know, all the horrible things. So I took it to be my duty that that's not the way the life goes. And I went you know, teaching them through the dance, mm -hmm. the, the positive thing in the dance for them to know this is the way it's supposed to be like. It's not for you to just see it because I like it. And what I, you, you suffer, you suffer, you take it. But those are the things that the refugee children remember yes. from five years old growing up, you know, seeing, uh, um, you know, their body, somebody okay. killing them, yeah. somebody yeah. taking it from them. You know, like especially like the farm, the farming dance, like rice, yeah. the rice that they eat. I teach them the farming dance. Mm. You know, like if somebody took your rice from you when you were hungry, they carry with it. No, you don't do it that way. That's not the way the life goes. Yeah. You, you start teaching them the farming dance, you know, it's self-sufficient. You have to wait for it in unity and in love and in peace, you know, yeah. you, you know, together. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I would love to really go back to to Liberia and teach them because they, you know, they, there's a lot, there's a whole lot that left out that do not, uh, you know, the young people that do not remember. Right. But what you just described to the immigrant, uh, to the children is wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Putu or Tony, either one. Yeah. I'm here now. There, right, right. <laughs> I'm currently here. I mean, I, I come back because I have a lot of family, but also uh -huh. uh, to to maintain these pedagogical lineages, and I'm studying from my teachers as well, and maintaining that relationship, um, which which we could do from afar, but it, it, we have the privileges again uh, to to be able to travel back and forth. We have a very strange privilege right now during the pandemic mm -hmm. because not. U.S. citizens aren't allowed into Indonesia, <laughs> and they're usually occupying large portions of Bali. Right. Um, so I have this weird kind of uh, privilege to be back in, in, back in the home country. But I try and go back every year and mm -hmm. and teach as much as we can uh, to the the incoming generation and also uh, sharing developments across the board. But also part of the reason that I'm into heavy metals to begin with is actually because Heavy metal in Indonesia is actually really big and a point of indigeneity, which is a very interesting point on its own, but we can, uh, that's part of where that idea comes from. Yeah. So much to talk about. Tony, you've got the last word for this. As I mentioned before, you know, talking about that, that link in that chain, I mean, I do visit Puerto Rico. I've took several workshops. Mm -hmm. There's many um, elders, uh, bom bombero, bomberos, bomberas that are out here in, in you know, New York, Chicago, mm -hmm. um, you, know, you know, and, and, and amazing, amazing practitioners that, you know, luckily... Again, it's just building those pipelines and those channels for people to understand, hey, we have this over here, hey, we have that.
So uh, me per se, I don't, I don't think I've, you know, anytime soon, I'm, I'm very humble about that, that I would ever teach in Puerto Rico, but I would be so honored to have that opportunity. But I think connecting those elders from Puerto Rico, connecting those artisans uh, uh, from, from New York, from Chicago, from all, all around the United States that are out here, putting that work in in that time, connecting them and bringing them to Philly, right? Adding to what I'm offering here because I'm just at peace. And to see the different forms, to see the different styles and to witness these elders that you hear their names, but you have never seen them you yeah. know and, and try to try you know because it, it is a challenge everybody you know has their things but uh, i mean it's always you know trying our best to build and network the best we can but little by little these collaborations are being made um they are behind right the the, the doors and and little by little they will be shared and coming out for everybody and and i think you know, I, I, I get starstruck when I see these elders. It's like, ah, is that, uh, you know, I, and I'm so humbled by, by, by seeing them. And, you know, you, you, you know, and I know Putsu mentioned something about some, you know, people having this arrogance and having, but it, it's important about understanding. And again, those that are doing it the right way understand, right, where, where, where they stand in that line or in that link of that much bigger chain, right? And I think, uh, um, that's where I stand, and I, I I think it's I'm that piece to bring what I bring to the students, to the community, to the young ones out here. But it's a much much larger picture, and you know I'm honored to be doing what I'm doing out here. But I think the most important thing is building that networking, right? Knowing what Alex does and being able to share, uh, knowing what Kumasa does, Putu, and be able to spread the different cultures, not just Boma and Plena, but just. People have the respect for this beauty uh, um, that they get because there's not many of us out here, right? Uh, whether it's dying, whether it was dying, whether it's, you know, it, it's just showing that respect and that honor to what that person is doing and preserving. So thank you. Oh, thank you all so much. We have pretty much run out of time. Uh, I could, I don't know what to, to say beyond the fact that I feel like obviously I think this panel did what we all hope to do, which is it opened a conversation. And we would hope that those who, this very wonderful little critical mass nucleus of people who attended today, if you would indeed extend this conversation and continue in the way that these artists have put out what needs to be thought about in terms of integrity, in terms of um, intention, in terms of uh, how do you deal with issues of um, commercialization and uh, respect and value. So I thank you all and I uh, thank PFP for this uh, uh, opportunity and for this platform. And um, I guess we can just say goodbye. <laughs>